The honorary degree will now be conferred, and it is my honor to introduce Stuart Blossom. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to introduce Stuart Blossom. At the heart of his life and career lies the sheer joy of discovery. A renowned geologist, intrepid prospector, and visionary philanthropist, Stuart Blossom has made lasting contributions to his discipline, to his business, uh, and to higher education. After earning his BSc at the University of British Columbia, and his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, Stuart Blossom undertook a journey of exploration that has lasted nearly half a century. He first applied his exceptional skills in fieldwork with the Geological Survey of Canada, providing leadership for regional mapping and research programs for 15 years. Subsequently, he began to explore modes of mineral formation from Mexico to the Arctic, and discovered several major occurrences of gold, copper, and other metals in North America. In 1981, together with a fellow geologist, he began to explore areas of the Northwest Territories in the belief that conditions there were favorable for the occurrence of diamonds. And drawing on his extensive knowledge of Canadian geology, he traced a 700-kilometer path etched by the glaciers millennia ago, eventually discovering diamond deposits where today the Akati Diamond Mine is the foundation of Canada's growing diamond industry. That same spirit of discovery informs his philanthropy, for Stuart Blusson believes wholeheartedly in the values of higher education and in the paramount importance of basic scientific research. In support of both, he has shared his great fortune most generously. In 1998, he bestowed a multi-million dollar gift to, the U to UBC for genetic research. A few years later, another significant donation to Quest University. He has also made major contributions in support of the Vancouver Aquarium and spinal cord research. In 2006, he donated significant funding to the Archon X Prize to develop a quick way to sequence the human genome. And we too have been beneficiaries of his exceptional generosity. Together with his wife, Marilyn, Stuart Blusson has made a singularly magnificent gift in support of our Faculty of Health Sciences, the largest private gift in our history. Stuart Blusson. <laughs> Stuart Blusson is an officer of the Order of Canada, a recipient of the Logan Medal from the Geological Association of Canada. In September, we named our new Faculty of Health Sciences building Blossom Hall in honor of, his out, of this outstanding British Columbian and steadfast friend of higher education. Stuart Blossom, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree Doctor of Science honoris causa. Dr. Blossom will be hooded by Dr. John Driver, the Vice President Academic, and Miss Kate Ross, our registrar. It is with pleasure that I now call on Dr. Stuart Blusson for his convocation address. Dr. Blusson. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, honored, especially honored guests, uh, graduates in particular, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I must say, uh, uh, President Stevenson, that was um, a lot of my speech right there. <laughs> I must say, I'm quite thanks for the, uh, for, the, for the honor of what you said and also for this particular honor of this degree. It's especially humbling for me to think of the uh, very distinguished company that um, I'm a part of, previous honorees in this beautiful campus. And to the graduates, <clears throat> I'm privileged to, to, to be with you at this moment, and um, I'm very happy that, that you have come so far. Now, I'm being a big supporter, as you know, of, uh, <clears throat> of research. I thought it appropriate that a glimpse into my past maybe help explain why. And, and, and along the way, sort of suggest some of the uh, principles of research that have helped me out and, and can lead to discovery. As far back as I can remember, there is a sense of always wanting to be different. For instance, even in a childhood, uh, one of my, my buddies thought, um, dreamt about living on a ranch, I yearned for a teepee. And um, originality is one of the things that, of course, is, is very hard to maintain. Some people say it's one of the most difficult things for the human mind to maintain. I think, um, and the, uh, it's likened to uh, the problem of herd instinct. Uh, perhaps it's something we are born with, so we have to work harder to, to positively maintain it. And I think being a little different is probably helpful in that regard. Now, the big step of going from high school to university that uh, President Stevenson mentioned is one that uh, is found, it's probably quite challenging for a lot of students. But when I was going through that period, I just unfortunate to be working in the wilderness up in Chilcotin, ran across the most inspiring, enthused prospector that I've ever met. And being that I was already committed to an outdoor life, it came to me in a flash. That's it. My, my career path. Imagine uh, exploring in the great outdoors for the rest of your life. So I just couldn't wait. With that intense interest, I just couldn't wait to get to UBC. And uh, so there was no problem there in, in that transition. And when there, I would even noticed that, in, especially in geology class, there really wasn't as much as I expected. So along with the courses, I sort of had my own little curriculum, and even at times uh, questioned the questions on exams, which always didn't go over very well. But, um, I must say that uh, then the next step, going to, to Berkeley, was with uh, something else again. Imagine arriving there at the greatest time and place in the 60s, the, so enlightening. There was no exams even. It was a round table with uh, all the students taking turns in seminars and critically reviewing and mostly tearing apart just about everything that was coming out in research at that time. <clears throat> it was then when I had the dream to set up my own research institute, all things. And little did I know at the time that it would, in fact, probably, it would, in fact, come to pass, not in the way I envisaged it, where I would <clears throat> be having all the fun, doing all the work, because <clears throat> the way it is now, that would take me many more lifetimes. But uh, it came about in concept, really, with um, supporting so many others to do just that, and also to support the Quest University, which in itself is a, a unique experiment in learning and critical thinking. But um, it paramount, as you know, in geology for field work, and that's where the GSC came in. Right from my earliest days at UBC, I spent continuous summers with the best collection of inspired 
and gifted geoscientists ever assembled, the, the renowned Geological Survey of Canada. Continuous summers, imagine continuous summers up north uh, in an area that had never been explored geologically, and you can really only do once. The pull was so strong, in fact, over that 20 years, that later when our budgets were cut and most of us were supposed to be confined to barracks, so to speak, and do our write-ups and things, I somehow managed to finance first a float plane, then a helicopter, and went up on my own anyways, at my own expense. And my wife, Marilyn, even came along with me once. And um, even to the point at, at uh, one camp in the Yukon, and I'll tell you, she had to stare down a grizzly bear, and uh, I wonder why she never came back. <laughs> but um, anyway, that, that was... Uh, that was a big part of, uh, of my career with the GSC. Um, it was such an, an incredible time. But I, in fact, I really had two careers. The one most noted for, I suppose, is as a diamond prospector. But in my mind, those golden years with the geological survey were just hard to beat. Just about every day, there was some new discovery. Whether it was big or small, it was always there, and the joy is incredible. Something that, you know, the satisfaction of coming up with something, unraveling something for the very first time is, is something everybody should experience. It's, and nobody can take that away from you, <clears throat> no matter where the information goes from there. So uh, you should never fret over concerns of misdirected research credits or whatever, because <clears throat> from my point of view, the real payoff you've already got. So the second career, I was fortunate enough to team up with two great guys, Hugo and, uh, Hugo and Chuck. Our personal skills and knowledge just complemented each other beautifully. And that, again, is a, an important part of doing research, these team efforts at work. Well, we spent the next couple of years looking at just about every prospective site for diamonds in North America, and even found a bunch ourselves. And in the process, ended up uh, this big project we had going near the Mackenzie River. But near the end of the season, and things weren't going all that great, we'd found pink kimberlites and even dated them, but they weren't the greatest. The yeah. <clears throat> opportunity struck. And just like um, <clears throat> Pasteur remarked, opportunity favors a prepared mind. And we were prepared. We, uh, we, immediately understood what that opportunity meant. And it was coming across uh, a secret camp of the Beers where they'd, they'd found the much better indicator minerals for diamonds than we'd found. This was the right stuff. And we, we, we found that out ourselves by taking samples around and whatnot. And, but, um, Reasons slipped in to our thinking, and at that stage in, in discovery, it's not a good thing to do. It's something that can often mislead you because you don't have enough data. And it would seem pretty obvious at the time that well, the, we dated our, our pipes, so the debris from <clears throat> De Beers presumed they came from the same event. They were sitting on much younger rocks then our dating implied. So they were obviously in the wrong place, but just up ice 10 miles or so from them was the right age rocks. <clears throat> so being misled by our assumption, we, uh, before leaving the field, at great expense, acquired that ground, and, <clears throat> and then we and gleefully headed back south for winter 
thinking we'd hit the jackpot. Well, that wasn't the case. Rushing back next summer to our new site to get going on our sampling, at one of the first landings I made, uh, <clears throat> opportunity came again. And this was the key for us. While just while jumping across a creek on a bunch of boulders, it struck me. I just couldn't uh, miss it. They were almost all the same rock, and a rock of a red type of red granite that could only have come from hundreds of miles away to the east. So, in, in effect, we were out to lunch too. We were in the, we were not in the right place, and by now we'd spent most of our budget. <clears throat> This essentially cost us another year. <clears throat> but um, it, it, it came clear to me, almost at the, on the spot, the, the, a bigger picture. What was happening here is that this debris that was so good didn't come from anything around. Any, it had nothing to do with our cluster, which wasn't that far away. But it, this was a dumping ground for the massive eastern ice sheet. It's, it's terminal moraine. So we weren't in the right place, but at least we knew it. <clears throat> the, beer, the beers didn't and continued on there for years until they finally gave up. But here we are. Now we're faced with the problem of this vast terrain. What do we do? Well, by this time, Hugo's company had been taken over by a big oil company, and so, uh, and our few private investors had, or had started to get impatient. So I, the idea came to me that, the, you know, it's, again, it goes back to this expression, necessity is the mother of invention. The only way we could operate further and pursue this was, I thought about, let's, let's see if nature can help us out itself. The, the massive amount of water flowing around from thousands of feet of, of, of ice, the, all the melt water, left a, left a mark. It had to leave a mark if you knew how to read it. And of course, again, I had all, all this preparation from years of work up north. It was what we called designer samples. Sites where nature had concentrated and even reconcentrated the glacial tills. So that we only had to take a few select samples to get where we had to go. And as it, as it turned out, we managed to get right on target with less than 90 samples going all the way across the barren lands. A lot of people don't quite appreciate that. Uh, but our our design worked. In, in fact, it was like designing the ideal experiment where a little bit of uh, less than perfect data, say, can give you a big result. And this is what we got. We got a big result from very little information, really. But it was all the right things. <clears throat> so, but the trouble was, uh, even with 90 samples at that stage, we were $20,000, imagine, $20,000 over budget. But that's a time, you gotta remember, when mortgage rates were going through the roof, and so to us, that was a lot of money. We had to shut down. We even shut down the lab work, not knowing that sample 81 out of the 90 was our discovery sample. It was already in the lab. So imagine, think about it. <clears throat> This multi-billion dollar diamond industry is now backed up three years. First at the start, and now uh, most of it due to the fact that Chuck and I are broke, and the few uh, backers that we have approached thought we are nuts. By comparison, since then, since the discovery was made, over, well over a billion dollars has been spent by others, including De Beers, grid sampling most of the north, you know, to, to, to really little, little in the way of results. But after, 
when the, finally, after the two years, that the lab choked on our sample number 81, unfortunately, a uh, public company, Diamet, rushed in. And <clears throat> that eventually led to us losing, effectively, the other mine next door to us. Because with a public company, of course, your secrecy is compromised. And the massive staking rush had taken place. As you know, you've probably heard of it, this big one of the biggest staking rushes ever anywhere. So now that our mine is, um, is getting on, getting on in, in its age and the operator, BHP, has shut down expiration, I've been allowed, which I couldn't do before, to get, use some of my more radical ideas in expiration and some of the new techniques I've developed in, in geophysics to operate in areas that were out of bounds before. And um, <clears throat> the program this summer, the data from the program this summer is just now coming in. And I'm, I'm happy to say that it uh, looks like there's gonna be a lot more to do in this mine site. So, <clears throat> so in summing up, to all you graduates, I, uh, it's an open invitation to come up north Come up and, and visit us. It'd be great if we could cross paths sometime. You've come a long way already, and you, you, I'd like to see you make, take full advantage of this new knowledge you've gained. And there's so much uh, to look forward to. When we speak of research, a lot of people think of science only, but in reality, of course, Research is part of all, all, forms, all parts of life wherever new knowledge is, is being created. And uh, in research, of course, you're a student all your life. It's never finished. Congratulations and good luck. And thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Blossom.